Here's an age-old question. Consider a sequence of prime numbers. So we have 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and so on. Now, given a prime number p, how would I predict the next prime number in the sequence? This question is actually incredibly difficult. It's the type of problem that if you solve it, you would be among the math legends like Euler, Newton, or Riemann. Not to mention, there's also a $1 million prize for someone who can solve a related problem. But just because this question is so difficult, it doesn't stop us from exploring the various things about the distribution of primes. Prime numbers are one of the simplest yet most complicated and confusing topics of math. Let's start from the basics. In middle school, we learned that any number can be factored into prime numbers. For example, the number 30 can be written as 2 into 3 into 5. So we have two types of numbers, primes and composite numbers. So Euclid's theorem is fairly straightforward. It just states that there are an infinite number of primes. So let's quickly go over a proof. This proof is actually pretty interesting if you ask me. We're going to be using something called proof by contradiction. So first let's assume that the statement is false, that there are a finite number of primes. So let p be the product of all of these prime numbers. So let's examine the number q, which is equal to p plus 1. So q can be either prime or composite. So if it's prime, then we've already contradicted the fact that we found a new prime. And if q isn't prime, then it has to be made up of prime factors. So let's look at one of those prime factors, p. And since p also divides capital P, it should divide p minus q, which is, which is equal to 1. And since no prime number divides 1, it's another contradiction. And so we've proved that there are an infinite number of primes. So before I talk about this, let's talk a bit about series. So series is just a sum of numbers. This is not to be confused with a sequence. An example of a series is the harmonic series which looks like this. This series was shown to be divergent in the 14th century. What this means is that it does not approach a finite value, it just goes on to infinity. And I'll leave a link in the description to how this is done if you're interested, but for now let's move on. A harmonic series is also known as a p-series, which is a more general term, but the p-value is equal to 1. So the general formula for a p-series is as follows. So p-series always converge when the p-value is greater than 1. When I say converge, I mean that it approaches a finite value. So I'll leave a link to an article that shows why this is true, but it has to do with the integral test. So let's move on from that. So what we're going to do is define something called a zeta function, and this essentially the zeta function just gives a p-series given a p-value. But I hear you say, how does this have anything to do with prime numbers? That's why we talk about the Euler product formula. But instead of just giving you the formula and talking about it, I want to discover it together. So let's just start off with the zeta function and its expansion. So we have this long formula. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by the second term of in the sequence. So in this case, it's just 1 by 2 to the power of s. So you can see on the right side, we have every single power, uh, multiple of 2 in the denominator. So if we want to remove that from the original zeta function, we just do zeta of s minus one half to the power of s times zeta of s. So that's what we're going to do. And we have the remaining terms. Then we're going to repeat the same process, except for the second term of this new sequence. So we're going to multiply both sides by the second term of the sequence now, which is one by three to the power of s. So if we do that, we have these terms and then we subtract them from the original series. And then we do this again, and then again, and then again. So if you notice that every time we do this, we're subtracting multiples of each number. So the second term in our sequence is always going to be prime. So if we continue this process to infinity, we get something like this. And if we move all the primes to the other side, writing this formally, we have sigma 1 over n to the s is equal to 1 over 1 minus p to the negative s for every single prime number. This is called the Euler product formula. It gives us the first relation between the zeta function and prime numbers. And since this formula was discovered in 1737, the modern study of prime numbers has always been based on the zeta function.
The idea for the prime counting function is pretty simple. Let's give it a number x. Tell me the number of primes below that number. And this might be confusing, but we actually denote this function by the character pi. So a few examples are pi of 5 is 3, pi of 10 is 4, pi of 20 is 8. So the prime counting function is a step function, means it's not continuous. So let's look at the graph of the prime counting function. And this function was introduced by Gauss in the 18th century. And another thing Gauss showed was that you could approximate the value of the prime counting function with the expression x divided by ln of x. This fact is called the prime number theorem. More formally written, it states that the limit as x approaches infinity of pi of x divided by x by ln x is equal to 1. So if we take a look at this graph, that's pi of x by x, of n, x by ln of x, you can see how it closely approaches 1 as x approaches infinity. So another result we can take from the prime number theorem is that the probability that a random chosen number is prime is roughly 1 by ln of x. In terms of the prime counting function, the prime number theorem tells us that each average step in the prime number in the prime counting function is around ln of x. However, there's actually a better function to approximate the prime counting function. What's the indefinite integral of 1 over ln of x? So my first instinct would just be to, oh, let's just plug it in in Wolfram Alpha. So I did that and we get li of x plus c. This li function is called the logarithmic integral function. The indefinite integral of 1 over ln of t cannot actually be described algebraically. So we use this special function to describe it. It actually turns out that li of x is a better approximation for the prime counting function than x by ln of x. Here, let's look at all three of them graphed. Wikipedia has a nice table that shows numerically why this is true. You can pause and take a look at this table, but for now I'm just gonna skip it. Now let's go back to the prime number theorem. Since li of x approximates pi of x, the limit as x approaches infinity of pi of x divided by li of x is equal to 1. This way of approximating the prime counting function by the logarithmic integral function is was discovered by Dirichlet after Gauss mailed him his prime number theorem. Bernard Riemann was a German mathematician who studied fields like analysis, number theory, and differential geometry. I'm sure you've heard his name before in your calculus class. For example, he came up with Riemann sums. So he was one of the first to study what happens when you extend the domain of the zeta function from real numbers to complex numbers. So 3Blue1Run Run has made a fantastic video on the Riemann zeta function, and I think you should probably watch it, but let's quickly go over what the Riemann zeta function is. So the Riemann zeta function is essentially the zeta function that we talked about earlier, except we extend the domain to the whole complex plane and it converges for a real component greater than one. Let's look at why this is true. So let's look at some input a plus bi into the Riemann zeta function. So let's just focus on the first term, which is one half to the s. So it's just one half to the a plus bi, which we can split into one half to the a times one half to the bi. But what does it mean to take a complex exponent? And what this turns out is that a complex exponent just accounts for some rotation along the unit circle with no change in the magnitude. I've left a link to a video by 3 blue one run again that explains this pretty well, but what this means for us is that the magnitude of each term in the Riemann zeta function only depends on the real component. And so Riemann zeta function converges for re of z which is greater than 1. But what about the other side of the Riemann zeta function? where the real component is less than or equal to 1. So Riemann used something called analytic continuation. Basically, he just extended the domain of the zeta function by quote-unquote flipping it across, across that line. So what Riemann studied was the zeros of the zeta function. So to examine this, let's look at the formula of this Riemann zeta function with analytic continuation. So this term right here is the gamma function. See, the idea of the gamma function is to provide a continuous function that goes through factorial points. Since I'm very lazy, I'm just going to pull a clip from an old video of me talking about the gamma function. The gamma function, which looks like this. 
is equal to n minus 1 factorial for all positive n. The gamma function is an extremely important function that appears all over math. It gives us a way to extend the familiar domain of factorials from positive integers to positive real and even complex numbers. Basically, the goal of the gamma function was to define a smooth curve that would go through factorial points. Here, I've plotted three points, which all satisfy f of x is equal to n minus 1 factorial. So for x minus 1, the y coordinate is 1 minus 1 factorial, which is 1. Similarly, for x is equal to 2, the y coordinate is 2 minus 1 factorial, which is equal to 1. And finally, for x is equal to 3, the y coordinate is 3 minus 1 factorial, which is equal to 2. The gamma function is defined as follows. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative t times t to the power of z minus 1. Here's a challenge for you. Try to see why this equals n minus 1 for positive integers. Hint, it has to do with integration by parts. Thank you, me from six months ago. By the way, if you haven't checked out that video, I highly recommend you do so. Going back to the Riemann zeta function, let's take a look at the formula and see when it equals zero. So this sine term should equal zero for all negative even integers. These zeros are called trivial zeros. For positive even integers, the gamma function forms something called a pole, which cancels out the zero of the sine function. I'm not gonna explain what this means here, but I've left a few links in the description to understand this. So a nice illustration of the trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function would be to graph the real components of both the input and the output. Look how zeta equals zero at negative real numbers. So going back to the Euler product formula, if the real common component of the function is greater than one, one of the products have to be equal to zero for zeta to be equal to zero. And this is impossible for, because of Euclid's theorem which if you remember states that there are an infinite number of primes, so the right component cannot be equal to zero. So that means that the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function have to have real component between zero and one. So let's see if we can visualize them. The problem being that complex functions are like pretty hard to visualize, but I'm gonna try my best. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix the real component of our input and we'll have the x-axis be the imaginary component. Then we're gonna have two graphs, one for the real component and one for the imaginary component of our output. So since we know that all the zeros we're looking for are between zero and one, let's vary the real component from zero to one. I'm gonna play the animation out. So now, Let's take a look at these red circles and focus on the red circles and play the animation once more. So before we start, let's look at the imaginary component. Notice how it equals zero at this point. Now let's play the animation. Let's play it once more. Stop. Notice that re of s is equal to 0 0.5, the real component intersects with the imaginary component at zero. Let's move a little bit more front to re of s is equal to 0 0.6, and notice how there are no zeros in the zeta function. So this is the famous Riemann hypothesis, what states that all the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function have real component one half, or 0 0.5. The Clay Math Institute has offered a million dollars to anyone who can prove this fact. So I'm sure you're wondering how all of this has any connection to the prime numbers. So for this topic, let's go back to the prime number theorem. Remember how we could approximate the value of the prime counting function pi of x using the logarithmic integral function? Well, the Riemann hypothesis helps us talk about the error by which the logarithmic integral function can approximate this function. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, this error is no more than some function of order square root of x times ln of x. And this goes both ways. If you can prove that the error is a function of order square root of x times log of x, the Riemann hypothesis is true. A more, a more direct question is 
how is the Riemann hypothesis and primes related? So this would be where I talk about Riemann's explicit formula. Riemann's explicit formula gives us a direct formula for the prime counting function. And the second term over here is a sum of all non-trivial zeros p of the Riemann zeta function. Let's look at an animation of this function. Let me graph the prime counting function, and then let me graph the Riemann explicit formula using one trivial zero of the zeta function. Now let's increase the trivial zeros, and let's see how, how the graph becomes a better and better approximation. And so using the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function, we can approximate the prime counting function to a pretty high accuracy. At the time of making this video, the Riemann hypothesis remains an unsolved problem in the field of number theory. Each year, attempts are made and hopefully we can see a concrete solution to this problem. Thanks for watching.